to Innovation Insights, our live webinar series in which we dialogue with innovators from various industries, fields, and backgrounds. Thank you for joining our webinar today, Fashion's New Frontier, 3D Printing for Textile Innovation. I am your host today, Dr. Yolanda Sanders, and we are thrilled to have you join us as we explore the exciting world of 3D printing and its impact on fashion and textile de design. Please join me in welcoming John Kraut. I, I apologize, John. Please help me in welcoming John Krautmel and from Advanced Tech and Colton Melhoff from Stratasys. This team will guide us through a fascinating demonstration and discussion about 3D fabric printing technology, which is taking the fashion industry to new heights. We'll learn about the trademark 3D fashion technology and how it's transforming the creation of garments, wear, luxury accessories, and the automobile industry. Oh my goodness. This technology allows direct to textile printing in full color, offering new possibilities for creating unique designs and optical illusions on various fabrics. So I'm excited to see what our guests have in store for us today. I ask that you put questions that you have in the chat and we will have a dialogue about those. And whether you're a designer, manufacturer, or just curious about the latest trends in textile technology, I assure you, you're in for a treat. So let's get started. Welcome to Innovation Insights, John and Colton. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Yolanda. Pretty excited to be here. And I could talk about 3D printing for hours. Uh, John knows that. You know that. We've met enough times. Uh, so I hope this will be a fun conversation. And yeah, questions in chat would be great. And wherever this leads us, uh, I'm excited to go there with 3D printing, um, usually 3D printing uh, directly on a fabric for this conversation. Oh, thank you. Colton, why don't you start off by giving us a little bit of a background about how you have started in this? Yeah, sure. So this is me with my friend Andy. We call him Andy because he's printed out of a 3D printing material we call Agilus, and we can print in full color. So Stratasys as a whole actually has five technologies, but I've worked mostly with the technology we can print with seven materials at a time, similar to a paper printer. We can print in cyan, magenta, yellow, and white all at the same time to print full color models. And this material specifically is actually soft. So this is just a clip from a video, but I'm actually wiggling his ears back and forth. Uh, we have a fun gig at trade shows where we have a 3D printed banana that feels just like a banana. So it's fun 3D printing like we can do it now. I've been at Stratasys for six years. I actually started in technical support, fixing the machines. And now I've been an application engineer for three or four years working on customer solutions. And how do we best find the best workflow, software, hardware, what material to use and needs? How else can this 3D printer be of value and have a better return on investment for our customers? John, anything to add there? Yeah. So from my, from my perspective, again, I'm John Crowd-Hamill from Advanced Tech. We represent Stratasys in the Midwest, United States, and specifically I cover Iowa, which is how Yolanda and I met at Iowa State. And their fashion program is really close to my heart since my wife went through that program in the early 2000s. And oh, oh, a little while back, we had a really fun day of discussing the textile technology that we'll be going through. And uh, Yolanda was kind enough to take me uh, on a tour of the campus, and, and we've been staying in touch ever since. I, I think we're both still hoping at some point that Iowa State would, would leverage some of this technology for their students. But uh, yeah, just excited to dive into this and see what kind of questions people have. And uh, Colton has a ton of fantastic information here. So um, just excited to, to spread the word of this really cool technology that when I talk with manufacturers and folks around Iowa, it, most people don't know this exists, so it's really fun. Okay. And this started with uh, this printing on or printing full color technology. So that's where the, the roots and 
um, where I used to talk about the most and now has been 50% fabric for 50% fashion and, and textile industry and 50% kind of industrial design and quick uh, high fidelity prototypes. So uh, this is, I just want to bring up one of my other favorites. This is a cup that's 3D printed all with all those colors on it. It's sanded and polished afterwards, but it's printed with all the colors. So that doesn't need to be applied. And early in the design process, they may use uh, single color printing for early decisions. And then later they'll print in full color when they're going to make those later design changes changes and show people outside of the ID group. And the same thing can be done on fabric as a design process, and it can also be done on fabric as a production part. I just want to touch Stratasys for a sec, just to give a little bit more background. So we're playing with this polyjet technology, poly being many, and jet rejet material out of printhead, similar printing on, on paper. But there's also stereography and FDM, DLP printers. Staff is a powder-based printer that actually prints material that uh, originates from castor beans, which is a great sustainability environmental move we're making towards better manufacturing. So Stratasys is a much larger company, and John supports all of this as well. If you have questions about other 3D printing uh, items outside of this call, we're happy to address those as well. Yolanda knows how to get you in contact with us. I love to start any conversation with some examples. I want to show you where we may be going uh, or where you may take this. So this is an example of a jacket that was 3D printed for uh, a photo shoot and a runway. And it was printed in four panels. So you can see down the middle, there's a slight seam. Uh, so there's two panels on the front and two panels on the back. Uh, these pieces that are these spikes, those were what was printed in full color on fabric. It was printed in those four panels first and then assembled into a garment. This is another one that is, it has a lenticular effect to it. Some people say, oh, you print with lenticular materials. Oh, that's not true. We print with cyan, magenta, yellow, white, and clear materials, but you can make lenticular designs. Lenticular, I actually only recently learned that it comes from a, a lentil bean is the actual origin of the word because the domes have a similar type of shape to it. And by these clear domes on top and two colors on the bottom, and it could be cut up into more sections, but there was a multiple colors on the bottom there, John shown change in color. Uh, the light reflects through the dome differently, like a magnifying glass or the lens of your eye. And by looking at it from different angle, it's going to change appearance seemingly for the whole piece, even though it's just two colors on the bottom. A lot of these examples originate from the European fashion market because that's where this machine was first started to be used. And we developed the requirements for this process with those customers. So that's where a lot of these designs come from, but can definitely be used uh, by more than just the fashion market. Okay, another John, one. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, Colton, you mentioned more than just the fashion market. And I, I saw some research and some information on your website about working with the car industry, especially yes. in Europe too? Yep. There's been some, some concept cars that have been at shows with the 3D printed designs on them. Off the top of my head, and John may know this, off the top of my head, I can't remember what brand it was, but there have Usually? been... Yes. So there have been concept cars designed with that. We haven't seen it. We have seen Polyjet prints in end-use parts on cars already. Uh, we've actually seen that years ago, but not 3D printing on fabric as an end-use part on a car. But it has to get to a concept car first before it gets to the consumer market. And that's where it's at right now. Thank you. This one does not have lenticular design, but still that color inside of a clear rock type element on the outside. Love that one. And then I always like to show this one because it doesn't consume the entire thing. We aren't just looking at 3D printed parts. We're looking at a garment that has value add by adding another manufacturing technique to the process. One more there, and then I want to get away from dresses a little bit. So, of course, handbags, and then we'll get you a little more of the non-fashion things here in a second. Handbags, of course, shoes. There's actually a there's a shoe by Alexander McQueen that's available on the market that is 3D printed on as well. That one's exciting. And then we idealize where else would we use this technology outside of fashion? So one concept would be to use it on speaker meshes. And this could be done for a, a home use, but also for larger applications. Think of at a, a corporate um, uh, conference room, you may have speakers on the side, and then you could 3D print on those to match the corporate brand and match the season that they are in. 
consumer. A priority design met with us to further imagine what could you use this for. And they came up with Braille. So you could 3D print Braille dots on clothing to know what that clothing is or on other items. If you have multiple dog leashes, you can know which one is which. Or watch bands or bracelets. So here's some bracelet designs that Priority Design came up with. And then more that we don't have examples for, but we see a lot of interest in where I like to see this going is especially in animatronics. So you imagine like the first couple dresses we saw the based on the way the model is moving, the dress was changing appearance in a couple different ways. And with animatronics, you can closely control what are those movements to get the look that you want. So animatronics is, I see as a huge application. Costume design for theme parks or on TV as special effects in movies. And then a lot of swag. Stuff we always get, keychains, handbags, anything to do with to think of diaper bags or those types of apparel where you want it to look fashionable, but it's also functional. And how are you going to bring those two things together? That's where I see a lot of this happening too. And then also in the art space. And I didn't have an example of, of just pure art on these slides, but we have a portfolio here, a QR code or 3 printed art.stress.com. And those, we have some art pieces where it actually started as something the model would put on them and it was printed as a solid piece. So it would weigh like 10 or 20 pounds. And now we can do it directly on a fabric. So it's much lighter than these art pieces were previously. Some of them were worn, some art pieces were printed not for use on the body. You did forget to mention the pet fashion market. Like yes. those, those neck scarves that we talked about with custom logos or animal names on it. They could be very customizable to each individual consumer yeah. or, yeah, so. I'm working on an example right now, of let's say like a dog collar and it could be printed directly on the collar or it could also be a widget that is printed to attach to the collar and I could have the, mm. the dog's name or maybe an embedded, we can print and pause in the middle of print, put a, an NFC chip in there or RFID chip in there to then communicate the information like an embedded chip would be for the dog, but one that you can read with your phone instead of reading it with an expensive scanner for pet chips. And that could be something smaller than then clips on, but is possible with 3D printing. And I'm guessing a question that's typically in the back of the minds when we talk with people about this is, okay, if we're going to be putting this on garments, if we're going to be putting it on pet wear and all this kind of stuff, could you talk real quick, and it, you might cover it later, but I forget, on machine washability? Yeah. So these pieces are washable with home use or industrial washing and dryer machines. It is not good for dry cleaning, but for traditional washing and drying works great. Uh, I've washed pieces at my house. I have coworkers that have washed their pieces and they have some, like, some denim jackets with cool designs on the back uh, and they wash them at home. So the, the adhesion, how well, how durable are these designs depends on what the design is. For example, uh, the first example we had were these tall here, this one on the right, were these tall spikes. That's not going to be as durable compared to pieces that are a bit flatter, like these pieces here, the third from the right. So it, it depends on that. And then on the material we're printing on. When this is printing on the material, it's actually wrapped around the fibers and holding onto those fibers. And the, the fabric we're printing on may have better or worse adhesion to the part. So for example, a leather or a, a vinyl PU material, if there's nothing to hold on to. It'll print, it'll attach. That'll work out just fine, but it's going to uh, pull off easier than other materials. So materials like there's a fabric called scuba, has nothing to do with scuba diving, works great. Suede and ultra suede, those work great because there's the little fibers to hold on to, even though they look like leather, they just need something to hold on to. And that, John, gets us into the print process. How are we going to do this? We talked about polyjet is the technology we're printing with. And this technology has 1,500 nozzles on the print ends. So it's jetting now 1,500 individually controlled nozzles, eight materials, there's a support and seven materials next to it. So we're gonna jet out this liquid resin. And then a UV light here is gonna cure the resin. That's the catalyst of this reaction, changing the liquid into a solid. It's like cooking an egg, put the egg on the stove, turns from liquid to solid. If you put that egg on the stove again, it's not gonna turn into a liquid. So there's another set of plastics called thermoplastics, those can get soft with heat and then they get harder again when they cool down. This is something else, this is a chemical reaction. So when I look at polyjet technology, I sum it up high level for printing on fabric. It's an acrylic material, it's a photopolymer, so it changes to a solid using UV light and it's jetted out of print heads, really high resolution. 
if we're looking at the smallest piece of Lego, a one by one stud that's eight by eight by three millimeters, that would be four million drops of resin. It's incredible resolution. Full color, transparent, multi drometer. And there's less like preparation for this technology compared to some technologies. So this is a quick time lapse of the printer printing. This is printing some ornaments, not directly on the fabric, but it's just printing some holiday ornaments. The semi-transparent clear material here is actually the support material that gets removed when the print is done. And then we're left with the red or green ornaments to hang on a holiday tree. So basically, Colton, it can be used to print individual units, but also print it onto textiles. Yeah. Yep. Wonderful. So there's a question in the chat here. Does a printing need any specific type of fabric or base? How does a printing deal with stretch stretchable textiles? Great question. Stretchable fabrics are great. I've done two-way stretch and four-way stretch fabrics. Spandex is one of my favorite materials to print on. It, the kind of difference just comes into how we're attaching it to the print tray. So this is the same printer setup compared to the, the previous video. Um, although in this one, uh, there's a different tray in it that's going to hold the fabric in place. So there's this metal frame around the outside that's going to hold the fabric while it's being printed on in the middle. So some fabrics that are extra stretchy, they uh, can't really be pulled tight to get all the ripples out of it. If you really stretch a fabric, then when you're done printing, it's going to then contract back together and you don't get the look you want. So for some extra stretchy fabrics, we'll actually use a adhesive tape in the middle to hold the fabric in place. And for non-stretchy fabrics, even like cotton t-shirt type materials, it is non-stretchy enough. We'll just place it on there and it's held on with the perimeter and that works great. Um, most all fabrics that I've tried have worked great as long as there's some texture to it. So staying a bit away from the vinyl leather-like materials, PU materials. So this is I have another view of that same print area. There's a metal frame around the outside that holds a fabric in place. This extra fabric around the fringe will actually be tucked down. It'll be tucked down before the print starts and we can print continuously 360 by 460 millimeters. So those dress designs we saw at the beginning, some of them were specifically designed around this building constraint to have each panel of the dress be able to fit within this area or at least uh, have the printable area of the dress fit within here. So maybe they're still going to use the fabric that goes off the side, but the print itself fits inside that area for each panel. Um, and here's a real-time video of just printing directly on the fabric. And Yolanda has quite a few samples of these types of designs. So if you're lucky enough to be close by, she has them in hand. And I'll photograph them too and include them with the video that we make after this. Great. It's amazing technology. It really is. Yeah, some cool stuff. I've got plenty that I've always collected them around me. Here's one a bracelet that I will wear when I go out to see, see people that I'm working with. And that kind of speaks to the durability of how many shows has this last me through. And I've never had a piece fall off. This one's printed on the ultra suede, uh, ultra suede material. So it looks like leather from far away, but it has really good adhesion and all these rocks are broken up into uh, disconnected pieces. That one, sorry, while I'm on the topic, even though I didn't actually plan to cover this. And I know my screen is small. But they're actually printed 20 at a time. Yeah, let's do this. So this is, if I can get it, stop censoring me. This is 20 bracelets printed at a time. And then I'll cut out the bracelet and glue on the clasp. Oh, very cool. Very cool. So zooming out, this is what the hardware looks like. It's tough to understand the inside and not understand what does a, a area look like that has this machine. So there's me for scale. And kind of how big the machine is. This area in the middle is where the parts are printed. And then to the right, there's this black box. That's the material cabinet where we load in canisters of the liquid resin. Looking at durability, jumping back to John's questions is at how strong is this stuff to hold onto the fabric? And it depends on the fabric. Here's a good close-up image of the 3D prints directly into the fabric. Um, this one's a pretty deep knit material. So you can see it going into that fabric holding on around the fibers. 
If we have a net or sheer material, it'll actually hold on to both sides. It'll connect the print on the back side of the fabric. Or jersey denim type materials, it'll hold on to the fibers. Ultra suede materials, it'll hold on to the fibers on the top. Sorry, the threads in the middle. Um, off of this chart would be things like vinyl and leather. Shoe fabrics may look very similar, but they absorb resin at different rates. And our goal is to have the resin absorb between these two examples. If it's absorbing very quickly, then it's going to have the color spread too far. And if it's not absorbing at all, then it's not holding on to anything after it cures. Uh, most fabrics are between these two extremes, which shows that even though fabric may look the same, it may act very differently. So that's why uh, we can always take good guesses and will this fabric work or not, but we try printing on it and then experiment afterwards with how well did that work. And that relates to a question in the chat about, can you print over non-flat fabrics like an embroidery structure or component trim? Yeah, good question. Uh, and have a great example of that. And we can print on non-fabric items too, which is where my example is going to come from. Um, so for example, this is a uh, perfume bottle that I print over the top of. And this bottle is pretty flat, but it's it has some height deviation to the top of this glass bottle. And that works just fine. So uh, we try, and my rule of thumb is like plus or minus one or two millimeters as far as the deviation across the top of the surface. So if we have embroidery that is going to be very tall, it's best to 3D print and then do the embroidery afterwards. If the embroidery is relatively short, then it makes sense to embroider first and then print. Again, that plus or minus two millimeters or so. If we print from a further distance, let's say we have some element on the substrate we're printing on that is taller and the print head needs to be above everything inside the print area. Then we're just jetting from a further distance and that works okay, but we're gonna get less geometric accuracy. But with these, that's not the uh, primary concern. So that works out fine as well. We're just gonna get a slightly different result. It's gonna take on more of the texture of the fabric and less of the precise design that the printer could output if it was closer to the part. The resin is actually coming out of the print nozzles at about 30 miles an hour, and it's not going a very far distance. So having it print from four millimeters up versus two millimeters up is not a big difference as far as how that resin is hitting the part. It's a bit of a difference when we are, for every layer that goes by, we're actually rolling the resin because it's jetted at slightly different amounts just because of how many nozzles there are. So that roller is going to then smooth out the top surface to make it more geometrically accurate. So for from a distance, we just don't have that mechanism doing anything. There's another question there. Is it possible to print conductive resins? Yes, uh, on textile, it can be used to smart textile development. So my yes is a, I'm familiar with this question, but the answer is a no. We do not print conductive resins there are some options to embed electronics into parts. And actually, my favorite example of this is printing uh, with a cavity somewhere inside of the design and pausing at the top of that cavity. You can insert something like a wireless LED. Wireless LEDs have a little coil of wire, and they could then be powered by a, another coil of wire that's outside of the part. And then it would turn on inside of the part. So you could do that. You could also pause and have some, some cavities to lay down a lead and then resume printing on top. So you're embedding those electronics inside or NFC chips or RFID chips, whatever the case is. We have done, going back to washing, we have done testing for color fastness after washing and adhesion. We passed all those fine colors. The question comes down to how is it going to work with your design and with your fabric? And that's where testing is the best method. When we look at a new piece of fabric, we'll often print an analyzer file on it. So this file will print a few different depths of, of a material, and then also some different colors and different gaps between the designs. And they'll characterize that piece of fabric so we know how well is that piece of fabric going to work with 3D printed process and how might we need to modify the design to work best with that piece of fabric. So here's another example I have that's just different heights of the material on this fabric for the first time I got it. And then I know that under these heights, we're going to see the texture of the fabric. And once we get up to a millimeter, then the texture of the fabric goes away and it's just the print. And that texture of the fabric will show through depending on how textured the fabric is. So for example, grandma's knit sweater, the texture is going to show through longer because it has deeper valleys than hills. Materials like spandex, they 
go to your design intent very quickly. So I'm actually gonna skip this one for the topic of the discussion. I think that was a little bit of a distraction. Looking at design, so how do we make a 3D file for this? And it's different than if we were to, let's say, embroider parts. If you embroider something, you may be able to bring in just a PNG or a JPEG or a, a line art file, a vector file. But for this case, with 3D printing, we need a vial that has volume to it. Uh, that's where the material is going to go. This can be designed in any program that you choose. Some designs, some programs are better suited for printing on fabric than others. When we print on fabric, we'll have many disconnected bodies, and some programs work better than that, or work better for that. SolidWorks, for example, is not good at those many different bodies. It works for some cases for doing small parts or long lines across the parts, but not many different bodies. For most of these examples, Rhino was the, the tool of choice. With Rhino, and I have an example on the next slide, we can program into it. For example, with my bracelet, we can program into it. I want a, a random point distribution across this area, and I want that to use a, a 3D Volronoi pattern, and I want to scale that and then do it again in clear and have that scale a little bit bigger. You can program them at all into it. It's like a drag and drop node-based programming language. You don't need to type anything out. It's just, and you see that come to life as you're making it. Blender is similar. It has a node-based programming tool. Doesn't, it's not quite as powerful, but it is free. It's also hard to learn. Uh, so I recommend that for university students. You have the resources, just need a laptop, download that for free, and you have the time to figure out how to use it. And mostly the determination for Blender. There's some other options. So for example, Keyshot and Adobe Substance, you could start with just a flat piece and then apply a displacement. Displacement would mean uh, a black and white image with some grayscale to it, and the white areas will be lifted up. The black areas will stay at the bottom. That works great for printing as well. And that's uh, really good for designers that are already working in the 2D space. They're familiar with Illustrator or uh, Photoshop. Um, great way to go there. Adobe Illustrator also has an extrude tool where you can do some simple designs. I don't actually have one for that. Uh, you can do some designs from Illustrator that here it is, that are inflated from a vector file. So this zebra, for example, was a vector file. So all the lines are drawn around the outside. And then an illustrator just extrude that out or inflate it. Then inflate just kind of makes the top like a balloon, which feels cool when it's printed on fabric. Or you can just bring it straight out like this logo was extruded straight out. So this is a pencil case with this cool zebra on it. And this was printed on as a pencil case. We just put the whole pencil case into the machine, tape it in place, and then print on it because that's simple enough to do instead of printing the panel and then sewing it into a pencil case. Okay, that's good to know that you can do some whole yeah. units already. Yeah, and, and I have not updated, oh yeah, I haven't updated the information today to include this. We just released a, a direct to garment tool as well. So it's a little bit smaller of a tray and it lets you fit a bigger garment into it. So for example, a pair of jeans, you could put the whole pair of jeans in there and then print on the thigh of the jeans or the calf of the jeans or the butt if you want to, but a flat spot that doesn't have seams on it. You could print on that spot and then you take it out and you can use it or a denim jacket or whatever area has a nice flat area to print on. Okay, that's too cool. That's right. really cool. Um, this is the example with Grasshopper. So I mentioned programming into it. What do you want that design to look like? This was uh, especially useful for the lenticular dress that was color changing and they could modify the height of each one of those domes and they had color in different areas of those domes and that was all controllable through this tool. Uh, so Rhino is a software program and Rhino, uh, Rhino is a very powerful CAD program. Rhino has Grasshopper as a tool inside of Rhino. The Rhino makes the 3D visualizations and then Grasshopper is the programming kind of extension of Rhino. Uh, here is the render. On the bottom left is a render that the program made. And then we bring in a GrabCAD print in the middle and prepare that for print. And this is just a small sample that I did. And then on the right is the 3D printed part. Uh, one more tool that's even easier than anything we've talked about yet. This tool 
is we call it 2D to 3D. So we identify this need. These um, designers who have a napkin sketch or a image, they want to 3D print directly on a fabric. Well, let's make that easier to do. So we have a tool called 2D to 3D. It's available to the public. It's actually downloadable from support.stratasys.com. I should update this with that link, but we can do that in the follow-up. And you can download this tool, install it on Windows. You can bring your own image into this tool and then tell the tool, I'm going to want to print this image at this size. So the finished piece, I want it to be 100 millimeters. And then we can either we can section that image into uh, hexagons or circles, triangles, squares, or Voronoi. Voronoi is similar to my bracelet, kind of nature-inspired uh, shapes. And, it will, and we can also tell it how big those shapes would be. I want it split into three millimeter hexagons or eight millimeter hexagons. It will split up that image and then export a model that has volume to it and we can 3D print. And then the last thing it can do is actually change the height of those pieces based on you want the light areas taller or the dark areas taller. And for doing this tool is very good at it and it's really easy to use. This is the one thing it does, but it does it really well. So it's a great kind of introduction into uh, how can you quickly get into printing on fabric. That was innovative and smart for the company Thanks. to do that. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we're always here to help with other designs. So one of my favorite meetings is always meeting with designers who know where they want to get to. This is uh, the type of design I want to make on fabric or not. And these are the tools that I have at my disposal. Right? And I can help them decide amongst the tools that are in their disposal or a tool that is uh, available for them to add and, and what is within their capability to learn, to prescribing that software workflow. Here's the thing that's going to work best for you. And it's different for each customer. It's different for each design that they want to get to. When we're designing for fabric, something that tool just automatically takes care of, but for other designs we need to think about is designing with a bottom that is flat. That way the whole thing is attached to the fabric and we don't have, we'll have minimum, minimal support that way. So most designs that we print have no support structure on them. Everything is self-supporting and that makes the process a lot easier for printing on fabric. We could print with support and we generally see this happen. If, uh, the, the best case use, use case I've seen is printing scales. So if you want to have scales that are overlapping each other, then you'll have supports under them. And you can remove that support afterwards. And you'll want to pick a fabric that is very okay with being blasted with water to get that support off. A great application. Generally, and all the examples I've shown today have no support on them. So when the print is done, you can take out the printer, assemble it, make your decisions based on how that design turned out. Do another iteration. We print on fabric. We're designing with uh, small pieces that together, when you zoom out, they make up one larger design. And that's for two reasons. One is so that the fabric can flex. So you'll notice that my, my bracelet is flexing between each of the elements themselves are not flexible enough to bend over. The material is soft. It's like a short 70. It's a little bit harder than a pencil eraser but it's not going to bend like this. That's what we're relying on the fabric to do. And the other reason is that the, the material is actually curling a bit as it prints. That's just part of the chemical reaction. If you have a large piece on fabric, then the fabric is going to curl and just makes an undesired result. So printing with small pieces, uh, my rule of thumb is like one inch in diameter or smaller. That works best. The exception to that is if it's skinny, we can make one long continuous line across the, the design. That works great because it doesn't have enough width to build up that flexing strength. We covered that. One fun workflow is printing directly onto sheer or mesh material, which I mentioned as an option. So for this, we actually put a piece of silicone down. Yeah, a great example there, John. We would put a piece of silicone on the tray. Otherwise, the print will attach to the tray with too much strength. So put a piece of silicone on the tray. We'll calibrate to the thickness of that fabric. Then we'll take the fabric off. So we just print you on the silicone. We'll print a couple layers just on the silicone, and then we'll put the fabric back on the tray and continue the print. So in this case, we are not only attaching to the fibers, we're actually attaching to the first few layers of the print through that mesh material. So we have the best adhesion that way, and the bottom is totally smooth. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs>
now I'm good. Still learning how to use Teams after so many years of virtual. Yes, and then just peels off the silicone easily. So it is really cool, you want to appreciate that. Most people fo- ask as their first follow-up question, uh, how long does this take to make? It's longer than embroidery. It's longer than silk screening. But it adds these capabilities that we can't do with other techniques. So it's not always the answer. It's not going to. And for these applications, I like to say that it, it's not great to look at a current design you can do with something else and say, how can I replace this design with now 3D printing? Probably isn't the best fit if that's the case, unless there's some pain point there. We're looking at what we have 3D printed, what other people have 3D printed. Uh, Now we can look at if people can do that means I can do this other design that is previously either impossible to do or really tedious. If you imagine some of those first dresses, they have many small pieces, hot fix or uh, those types of designs, they're tedious to put together. Now we can 3D print with all those numbers of elements, uh, uh, tens of thousands of elements at one time. So then how long is it going to take? Uh, after our preface, here's a good application and why it may take so long, but why that's still valuable. Looking at a few op- uh, a few examples here, this one on the top left is the um, front middle part of the dress of the lenticular uh, garments. Uh, there's two of those printed at the same time. In total, that was an hour and 15 minutes. So we'll often print multiple panels. If they fit, we'll print multiple at one time, and then you cut those out. This one in the middle on the top is an example of a much smaller decal. If we're going to print out uh, a smaller decal and then cut all those into pieces, we could do 221 of those on one tray. And sometimes this gets into how close could they fit together. Sometimes you might need more space between them if you're doing keychains or some other type of swag item. It often comes down to uh, the driving factor of the time is how tall the print is. Dollar it is, the more passes, the more layers you're going to print. So the Greta Odo dress lenticular design is only 0.1 inches tall. These pieces I have inspired from a Koosh ball are three quarters of an inch tall. So those take nine hours compared to uh, just over one hour. That's all I had prepared and planned. I'm glad we were able to cover all of it open to more questions or Yolanda and John, wherever else you want to take this, I probably have a visual I can pull up and we can discuss it more. Uh, I just want to do another shout out for the 3D printed arts, dustrasses.com site. Great examples uh, like we've been discussing and uh, yeah, happy to, to talk about more and get connected. Colton, this is fabulous. Just fabulous. It, it seems like you have been collaborating with individuals now, how yeah. does that happen and, and work because we have a designer based in europe uh, naomi Kempfer. she works with designers across the world and she is responsible for a lot of the collaborations we do so when we have runway models she works with those designers pulls in the right people if it's the designer that has the idea and the vision, and then someone else that is a 3D modeler and can bring that to life, and someone else from our production lab that will then 3D print those pieces. And then we send those back to the, the original designer, and they have their experts in sewing it together and actually draping it over the mannequins, whatever the case is there. And those, uh, those take months to put together. So it's quite a bit of the work that happens leading up to those events. Um, but they're a blast. Great. Oh, okay. We'll talk about that more. Yes. <laughs> there is a question in the chat about sustainability and any thoughts on the sustainability aspects yeah. of the technology. The, the 3D printing industry as a whole, and I would love to hear John's thoughts on this too, but the as a whole, our industry, I would say one has a lot of benefits to sustainability and on the other side has a lot of work to do. That's probably true for a lot of industries. So the benefits are things like bringing manufacturing closer to the warehouse or even manufacturing as parts are needed so we don't end up with wealth of unused product or product that sits on warehouse or product that is shipped. Let's say you run out of a component. It's some of my favorite examples. You say you run out of a component and because you ran out of it, you now need to get a last minute order from your injection molder, which is halfway around the world. And then you need to ship it overnight shipping on an airplane instead of usually you'd ship it on a cargo ship, which is much less CO2 emissions. 
Well, now with 3D printing, you can just manufacture that component down the road or in your lab space down the hall. And that eliminates a lot of those CO2 emissions. So there's lots of benefits around 3D printing, but as a whole, we have some work to grow as well. Stratasys released our first, there's another element to it, but part of it is sustainability. There, our first is sustainability report two years ago, and we updated it this year. And part of it is around social challenges and is also around environmental challenges. So we're covering both of those in this report. We're making good strides in that direction. There's some 3D printing technologies like our powder technology may has material derived from castor beans. Great examples there that are very quantitative. And around fashion, it's it's hard to put numbers onto, but we actually have we have a sustainability port specifically around fashion. I'll see if I can pull that up in a minute. Um, but we have a sustainability port or sustainability numbers specifically around fashion. And a lot of it is reducing that excess inventory. That makes sense. I think that's a really good point, Colton. It makes me think of March Madness wasn't that long ago, right? How many t-shirts potentially get printed up depending on which team wins? Because you need those immediately for companies to sell. And when you just have direct access to the manufacturing and you can, you probably wouldn't want to do it on that scale, but especially thinking about higher fashion, if you only need to make two, you can be very quick to to the part of the garment or whatever it is with little waste in typical or traditional manufacturing streams. So it's looking at it from a different perspective. You're probably not going to use this technology to make 10,000 t-shirts, right? But for the low quantity, the custom stuff, the thinking about like headrests and high-end automotive, or somebody wants an actress or actor wants a custom Gucci t-shirt with their logo or something on it you don't need to make a bunch of them to make the numbers make sense. So. Yeah. There isn't a good thing for me to share on screen right now, but on Stratasys, we call it the man- mindful manufacturing. So our mindful manufacturing, we have an article about it on our website and it talks about the, the benefits of 3D printing towards that. And then also what is Stratasys intentionally moving towards to better suit sustainability. There's things that just happen to be coincidences with our industry, but that's not good enough. We can't just be idle, be status quo, and say our industry is better. But we have to actually make strides in that direction as well. Makes sense. The question about Naomi's full name, would you be able yes. to repeat it? Uh, Naomi Kempfer. Kempfer is K-A-E-M-P-F-E-R. Okay. Fabulous. She's, yeah, she's done some great work. And a lot of that is around collaborations with other designers. And we will, we will have this recording on our YouTube channel for Innovation Insights. And then there will also be a web page dedicated uh, to this live webinar with some additional information too. Oh, back to collaboration, because one, I, I want to collaborate. And I know that you are wanting to you know, work with some students and with academic institutions. And so what's the best way to do that? Because it looks like you have some of the examples that you had some, it looks like students had brainstormed ideas. So what would be the best, best way for people to do that? If you want to reach out to me, I'm happy to field those. For the larger collaborations, Naomi takes those. I've done some that are more of a local, let's try this out and see how it goes. Let's do it with a, a student. You can use that as part of your student project. I'm happy to do that part. The My time is limited. So I the 3D printing part is easy and quick relative to working on what is the, what's the design process. Now we're going to make this 3D file. So as a collaborator, if you have the idea and you can put some work towards learning about the design process and come up with your design, I am always more than happy if you're putting into that design work to review your design, let you know this part's going to work well, this part's going to be a challenge. And when we get to the right point, print that out and let's yeah, make it into a real thing. I will be, I've been wanting to collaborate yeah. as I, yeah, I'm trained in fashion. And so I, I will be bothering you <laughs> now that I have more time. <laughs> and I have some good examples of getting started with it. Oh, so okay. that part's great as well. I was going to see if I can pull up an example here. 
Well, you're doing uh, that. We want to purchase because I know that we have some people that might be interested in purchasing the technology. And we also have uh, uh, some international participants in the webinar too. So yeah. what would be the best uh, place? I deal with just the fun stuff. So I'm going to hand that off to John. That's what I thought. There we go. I had to find the unmute button. And it probably depends on, for the global folks, the pricing could be a lot different. And part of the process that we typically go through for talking about bringing the technology in-house is figuring out all the parts of that workflow. So the printer is one part of it. And with the fashion stuff, most of the time, that's the largest component. But we want to make sure that whatever package we put together is not just something that's canned, um, but making sure that you have the whole workflow, like I said, and making sure you understand each part of that process. Um, so I was trying to pull up the uh, kind of the base price to give people an idea. Um, and I don't have the textile one on there specifically. Um, oh, I wish I, I meant to prepare that ahead of time. I apologize. Oh, that's but, okay. We can, uh, you know, yeah. put that in with the other information that we out. And John would be a great person to contact. Um, if it's not John's region, he can get you then connected with the right person. Uh, for sure. That's not the right one. Also, not, while no. we're wrapping up, and right. I think Colton's pulling something up, John, I would like for you to answer the question, how do you define innovation? Ooh, that's really good. Do we want to talk about Colton's example? Because I might need a second to think about that. Uh, yeah, you think about that. Good. <laughs> this is a, a one of the dresses that I collaborated on most recently. So there have been a few, a couple of universities, and this one was a, cool. a high school prom dress, but she made the design for these butterflies on her bow. Oh. And then we printed on it just as a flat sheet of fabric. Uh -huh. And when she received the fabric back, then she sewed it into that bow. Oh, adorable. And this is just with clear material. That's what she wanted to do. Make it look like it has these droplets on there reflecting mm -hmm. light differently. Love it. All right. I think I have an answer. And some context. I have a heavy engineering background. So my perspective is going to come from that route. I would say something along the, along the lines of using creative problem solving and novel techniques mm -hmm. to solve problems in a new way. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. If I, I try and say anything more, I'm going to, I'm just going to babble. So <laughs> I'll leave it no, at that. That's, that's good. That is good. I, I love that you have an engineering background and you're, you're working, you know, in this industry and also interfacing with textiles because many times people do not see um, how that merges. Mm. I'm, I'm trying to help the folks at Iowa State. There's a bionics group that's doing some really oh. cool stuff and trying to connect them with the engineering department. Um, cool. But uh, it seems like different departments are siloed and that happens across business and education. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I'd still love to see a lot more integration of technology into fashion. And if it is there, maybe I just don't see it. But yeah, I like agree. those wireless LEDs, I didn't know those existed. So Colton, I thank you for talking about that. And so many as cool soon as I found out, As soon as I found out those existed, I bought a kit. I'm just <laughs> waiting on the right idea to come to mind of, oh, that is a thing that is not what people would expect to use it for, but that's going to be the cool thing to use it for. Oh, yeah. Did they use that on that 3D printed art Stratasys website? Or maybe it was on LinkedIn or somewhere else. But one of the designers that Naomi worked with was working on designs where the garment would light up in different colors based on the emotion that was being created. I don't know if it's totally heat activated or something, but somewhere on the internet, I know I've okay. seen it. It may have been one of Naomi's LinkedIn posts. So I put her LinkedIn profile Thank in, the, you. in the chat and uh, she's a great person to follow. I don't think those are used. I'm, I don't know if maybe this is the one, but 
uh, I don't think they were used in this just because there's so much light going on and there's so much opportunity in this one to hide LED strips going inside of the dress. These tiny LEDs could be used in hard goods or samples like that, that uh, you can see all the way around the part. So there's no chance to hide a wire. Uh, a, a use case for this I've, I've kind of I have been playing with is a box of some sort. And the whole thing would be of a theme, but I don't want to let it all out of the box yet, but a box of some sort. And then a piece you can take out and put back into the box. And the box would have the coil of wire that is the power source and plugged into a USB to power. It. And then the piece you put into it would have the wireless LED. So when you put that in, now it turns on. How did, I don't understand how this worked, right? That'd be the fun part. Oh, that sounds amazing. That sounds amazing. This is really cool. Colton, we need to have your definition of innovation too. I think there's so many different ways it could be viewed. So I, I think one of the examples I love seeing the most is using existing techniques and technologies in a way to solve a new problem. Mm, I like that. I like that. Thank or you. a problem that those technologies were not designed for. Uh -huh. right? This was designed for this thing, but someone else is using it to save lives in this other way. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. That's, yeah. Great definitions. Thank you. We asked all of our guests on any webinar or podcast how they define innovation. And then we were compiling all of these. We put them out on our YouTube channel, but then I'll probably put them into some videos too. <laughs> Very cool. So, as we wrap up, the best way to get a hold of you is through email correct and we will have that information available to our participants yeah and someone asked if i can share the slides and i will i'll send those to you alana and if you want okay. to send those yeah. out and follow up you can do that absolutely too. absolutely thank you thank you for doing that that will be good are there any other questions from our participants our last couple minutes What, what is the, I have one, what is the, the most unusual application that you've seen of this technology that you're like, wow, I did not think of that. There, there are some really fun ways I've seen this used that I can't talk about yet. So that's the hard part, like me sifting through. I think in the special effects industry, there's been some really cool ideas of, and there's some obvious ways to use in special effects, but there's some other areas of uh -huh. seen on screen. You're not going to know that was 3D printed on fabric, uh -huh. replicating some techno, some technique that either has been hard to do or hasn't quite gotten quite right. And now mm -hmm. you can do it with 3D printing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that makes sense. That's, Okay, I challenge everyone to just keep your eyes out as you're observing around the world. Is that 3D printed on fabric or 3D printed polyjet technology on some other type of surface too? I like the perfume bottle too. Had not even thought of that. <laughs> yeah. Everyone, thank you for joining us today. And I... I'm going to put up on the screen here how you can stay in contact with us. We will have other webinars available to everyone. So please follow us on LinkedIn. Those of you that have participated today, we have started a badge system. So we will be sending you a participation badge. We believe in learning and professional development and sharing great ideas. So we want to encourage that. Please stay in contact with us and stay in contact with me. And Colton and John, thank you so much for sharing this technology. It is just inspiring and there's so many possibilities. And so we really, truly ap appreciate you sharing with us this new, I mean, it's not new technology, but technology that has many opportunities to change and revolutionize fashion and textile and other industries. I was thinking of 
as you were talking about the pet, uh, the collars and the having the codes there, children's wear, being able to track your child or because we don't want to embed a chip in our children, but <laughs> we can embed it. I don't it want to, but no one likes it. Well, yeah. You, you, you might want to sometimes, <laughs> but <laughs> th there are laws that hopefully prevent that from happening. But right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I just think that there's some endless possibilities and I love the Braille examples too, for accessibility too. So I know thank we're, you. I know we're over, but for your cuts, I want to share my screen one more time. Okay. Uh, thinking about what is the coolest example. This is one that's actually in Paisley park, Paisley park. Oh, okay. You know what Paisley park is. So that's, that part's good. Okay. Paisley park is Prince's home and now turned into the artist formerly known as Prince and then Prince and now turned into a museum. So one of the rooms you can go into for the, the tour, it, this is the last one on the tour, and this last room behind the camera here is actually amps turned into shelves with his shoes on it. Each pair of his shoes has an entire uh, coat and pants and everything goes with those pair of shoes. There's not enough space for that. So they have a couple of those fully displayed like this one in the middle, but they have all the shoes displayed. And then in the middle is more shoes in this piano. So the piano is actually 3D printed. The majority of that was printed in FDM. These guitars were printed. We got the 3D scan and then print those guitars. And the uh, keys are printed out of PolyJet using the full color technology. But where this wraps into our talk today is that the portrait in the back of Prince, that is actually, I think it's nine feet tall. It might be seven. I think it's nine feet tall. I should know. I've spent enough hours with it. But that was printed on fabric. So it was printed in 54 panels because we can only print up to so big. So we printed 54 panels and each print had a, a bunch of dots on it. So it's like a pointillism type art and it had this clear dome on the top that was rounded. So it doesn't do, the picture doesn't do it justice. But as you're walking through the loom, room with the lights at, choreographed the right way, uh, it reflects light in a very cool way. So that is 3D printed on fabric and then they were all attached to a canvas. Okay. There's something like 150,000 dots that make up that piece. <laughs> you have literally made my 2024. I mean, one, I love Prince. I was going to marry him, I thought, at one point <laughs> in my life. I was, I have been to Paisley Park, but not since this has been up. Yeah, this was up and about so two years just, ago. You have just combined all of my loves, Prince, textiles, innovation, technology, Printing. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. Well, with that, we will end. I am just uh, overcome. That is amazing. Amazing. <laughs> I'll add this to the slides I'll send you. Okay. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> Everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, we truly appreciate having you here. <laughs> Thanks. 